Postural restoration talks about this left AIC pattern that people get stuck in. Now, there's also a right AIC pattern, which a lot of people think they're in, but they're really not. The, the left AIC pattern is simply describing a body that is getting stuck on the right side. The right AIC pattern is describing a body that is on the left side, but we don't get stuck in a right AIC pattern. We get stuck in a left AIC over on the right side of the body. In, in reality, the body is oriented to the right. There can be people standing on their left leg with their weight on their left leg. I just did a session with somebody who looked as if they were on their left side, but their body was still oriented to the right because the testing is telling you that. The important thing though is a lot of people think of this in biomechanical terms, uh, stance and propulsion and toe off and push off, all these biomechanical terms. It can be thought of that way, but the problem becomes you get stuck in a pattern not because of the biomechanics. You get stuck in a pattern because of the sensory inputs that your brain uses to produce these biomechanics gets altered. So when someone loses sense of a left heel or a right arch or a right big toe, that is what keeps you in this left AIC pattern over on the right side. You don't get stuck there because you can no longer internally rotate a leg or externally rotate a leg or swing a torso. Those things stop occurring when sensory inputs are taken away and now you over sense one primary input. And that's really the, the focus of this video. So remember, sensory input, what the brain uses as sensory input produces the muscular output that we call this left AIC pattern or the right AIC pattern, depending on which leg you're on. So what would happen at a foot? Well, you need a heel, you need an arch, and you need a big toe. If you lose one of those three, you're going to stay on one side and that's gonna be the right side. So in the typical pattern, the right heel is being oversensed and the right arch and the right big toe, you lose that sense because the foot is constantly staying in a supinated position. Because you never go to the left side, the right arch and the right big toe are basically lost. Your brain stops using them because you never go to the left side. So the brain is overusing this right heel. If you go up to the right hip, the pelvis is oriented to the right, the right leg is usually internally rotated, and now the brain is overusing, overusing sensory input through the right hip joint compression sense to establish its location. On the left side, it's the exact opposite. This compression sense is taken away. So you've lost compression on the left side and you have increased compression sense on the right side. So your brain is overusing the sense of compression on the right side for upright, uh, for upright mobility. Up at the rib cage, you have a right side of the rib cage that's compressed. Again, compression, right diaphragm. Everything's compressed through the right side, so the brain is over-sensing pressure, sensing, over-sensing pressure on the right, and it's under-sensing pressure on the left. With the left foot, unfortunately, I don't have a left foot, but with the left foot, you're under-sensing the left heel because when you are over on your right side, the arch of the right foot and the arch of the left foot are essentially pushing you over to that right side. So the, the brain is over-sensing a left big toe and a left arch and under-sensing the left heel. Up at the neck, you have a neck that is oriented to the right and then side bent to the left to remain straight with the head turned to the left. So your brain is always interpreting sensory input through your ears, through your visual system, from the ground underneath, an internal compression sense with a head that's always in this position. So everything becomes very right-sided, coming right at you over here and then underused. And you also have a nostril on the right side, straight ahead. And if you want to think of it in more animal terms or biological history terms, uh, scent for animals is a, is a huge thing. And so their bodies are moving their nose through space. We do the same thing in terms of airflow. A lot of airflow might be going through the right nostril and not enough through the left because of the position that our head is in and a right eye and a right ear. So everything becomes over sensed on the right side to the point that we now start losing senses on the left and now we become senseless.
taken all together, what you're going to have is a bigger curve on the right side and smaller curves on the left. All our frequencies are over on the right side, uh, or not all, but the, there's greater frequency and greater curves over on that right side. It's just showing how the brain is sensing more on the right and less on the left. And that is really the pattern that we're talking about. So I saw four people last week who were all overusing their left canines. How did I know? Because I asked them when they bring their teeth together, do you sense left molars, left canines, right canines, or right molars? Do you, do you sense more one more than the other? And four of them said left canines. Now, what does that mean? Well, this is the problem. If you think of PRI in strictly biomechanical terms, these people cannot get neutral. They're going to be treated biomechanically, which means they're going to be concentrating on the pelvis. They're going to be concentrating on the rib cage. They're going to try to shift into the left hip. None of that was going to work for these individuals because they became senseless in certain areas. And when you become senseless in certain areas over on the left in general, and then the, the arch on the right foot, you're going to have to pick up senses somewhere else to help stabilize that body in an upright uh, position. And for them, it became their left canine. Why left canine? It's very simple. When you're over on this right side and your head is si and your head and neck are side bent to the left and rotated to the left, the overactivity of the right side neck muscles will start to shift the jaw on the right forward and a little bit to the left. And now they have over sensed their left canines. For three of them, I could get them neutral very, very quickly but it was through very specific techniques that I had to use just for them. I couldn't do it just, it was very highly specific. So asking what it was, it wouldn't really make a difference because it might not work for you. And it's just too complicated. But uh, another one, he couldn't stay neutral. I got three of them off of their left canine, so now they feel equal pressure throughout their mouth. The fourth, we would do things, but we couldn't eliminate that left canine sense. And why is that a problem? Well, it's going to be a problem because those left canines indicate an overactive neck on the right side. And when you have an overactive neck on the right side, you're usually going to have an overactive left hip flexor, which will, will prevent you from getting over to your left side effectively. They're going to remain oriented to the right. So if you could only think of NPRI as biomechanic terms and a lot of, and Three had worked doing some online programming that is all biomechanical in nature, and they could not get neutral because of this issue. You could do PRI techniques all day long, but it's, it's this, these individuals could not get off of that one sense because they had lost senses elsewhere. And that's how this works. We have to take away the one sense that is messing them up and keeping them in the pattern to let them regain their senses elsewhere. And at that point, they can have a, a wave. <laughs> they can have a wave that's more equal. If they couldn't get off that left canine, if their brain was still saying, I need this left canine for positional guidance as I move forward, you would not have equal signs on each side, which means they're going to stay in the left AI, equal signs, equal waves of the sine wave on each side. So they're going to stay over. Their sensory inputs are so now right dominant that they're going to stay on that right side. So they will stay in the left AIC pattern until you can get their sensory inputs equalized. So you always have to make sure that when you are working, doing with PRI with somebody, you want to make sure that they understand the head and the neck. They should have taken cervical revolution, um, cranial resolution, anything that's going to deal with the head. And this is my opinion, because if they don't understand the neck and how the teeth can be used for sensory inputs, you're gonna, you could do techniques all day long uh, and it's not gonna change a whole lot. So you really need to work with someone who you can find on the PRI website, just someone who knows what they're doing and you can't mass produce this. Every single person has a unique brain. So if you're doing some sort of, there's a lot of mastermind groups and coaching groups and all these other types of programs that are using PRI techniques and PRI methodology, but you can't do it for, you have to do it in an individual setting because of stuff like this. Uh, every brain is different. Every single, we all have different histories. We all have different traumas. We all have different sensory inputs that our brain is using to make sense of the world. 
So trying to do like some mass produced thing doesn't really work. That's not really what PRI is about. It's about the individual. So uh, that's just an example of how left AIC pattern, right, right AIC patterns, it is a flow state, a, a wave that should occur and will occur. It's not a biomechanical wave. It's a sensory wave. The sensory inputs give proper biomechanics. It's not that prior, pro, pro, proper biomechanics don't give proper sensory inputs. You're not guaranteed that. But if you get the sensory inputs correct, those biomechanics will flow without much of a problem.